In June, the United States and Cuba signed a memorandum of understanding that establishes coordination between the two countries on a range of public health issues. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with William Keck, a Professor Emeritus of Family and Community Medicine at Northeast Ohio Medical University. Dr. Keck has written a perspective article about the potential advantages of collaboration between the U.S. and Cuba and the threats to those prospects. Dr. Keck, you write in your article that embargo restrictions that are still in place seriously hamper the full collaboration that's promised in this recent Memorandum of Understanding. So why then did the Obama administration pursue that agreement? Well, of course, I can only assume that they did so because they believed it would be very difficult at this point in time to change the embargo, and because there seemed to be a growing understanding that not only was the embargo not effective, in doing what it was set up to do, that is, promote regime change in Cuba. But also, at this point, it was interfering with collaboration between the United States and Cuba in a number of areas, including health, that was probably not a good thing for either country. I suspect the idea for doing that, of course, is not only to make some corrections and do some things that would be positive for both countries now, but also to increasingly demonstrate the futility of continuing the embargo. That would be my guess, anyway. You write in your article that although Cuba is relatively poor, it compares favorably with the United States on a variety of population health measures. So how did Cuba achieve similar health outcomes with fewer resources? Well, it's a fascinating story. It really is, as you note, a poor country that's achieved essentially first world outcomes. And they did this by setting up a health system that considers health a human right. And that system is committed to providing equitable quality care to the entire population free of charge. And they've done that by putting in place a system of family doctor and nurse offices, one for every 650 to 12 or 1300 families across the island. So there are more than 11,000 currently of these family doctor and nurse offices in place, providing coverage from health professionals who live in the neighborhoods uh, where their patients live. So essentially, every Cuban has access to a physician. And the physician's approach is preventively oriented. So it it is very much prevention-oriented primary care Those physicians are linked then to a network of specialist centers called polyclinics who are then themselves linked to the country's uh, more than 250 hospitals. So not only do Cubans have access to preventively oriented primary care universally, they also have access to secondary and tertiary care when they need it. Because the embargo cut Cuba off from products developed in the United States, Cuba invested in biotechnology and other strategies to address public health threats, in some cases quite successfully. How will the renewal of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Cuba affect those Cuban initiatives? Will they continue to be strong? I think so. As you know, perhaps one of the silver linings of the embargo is that Cuba really had to go elsewhere to get medications and equipment and supplies that they would normally have bought from the United States. And so they really made a huge investment in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. So they now have 24 research institutions, 58 manufacturing facilities, and they've identified almost 900 essential medications that they need for their national health system. And currently they're providing 65 to 70% of those in-house manufacturing themselves. But they also wanted to address neglectical tropical diseases and other conditions that affect not only their island, but the global south. And they have managed to focus their research in areas that really address the greatest health needs the country faces. And in doing that, they've been able to produce some unique products. Those unique products are available only to Cubans and to citizens of other countries who indeed have not acted as we have to prevent the importation of anything made in Cuba. So this is a large segment now of the Cuban economy 
Cuba is, I think, politically and scientifically committed to continuing this process and to an increasing degree their ability to produce medications and supplies and equipment at relatively low cost has meant that their ability to sell them overseas is more and more and ending up as a mechanism to actually fund their ongoing research and development. So I think the Cuban work will continue. The real question, of course, is could we do it in tandem with them where that's appropriate and where they find it appropriate to link with us. So looking beyond the Obama administration, how do you see the outcome of the upcoming election affecting the prospects for ongoing collaboration between the United States and Cuba? I wish I could be absolutely sure, of course, but I think this this upcoming election is critical for this whole issue. I don't know where Mr. Trump stands on relationships with Cuba. We haven't heard much from him about that, and I can't predict where that will be. Certainly, we expect Hillary Clinton, if elected, would continue these policies, and she has expressed some interest, I believe, in eventually seeing the embargo rescinded. Of course, the embargo will take congressional action, so the upcoming election includes members of Congress will have a great deal of impact on this as well. It, of course, tends to be Democrats who are more sympathetic to this than Republicans. While that's not universal, that's probably a reasonable general statement. So if the Congress stays largely Republican or predominantly Republican, I would be surprised if the embargo would be lifted during the next congressional session. If Hillary Clinton is elected and she gets some support in Congress, then I think the opportunity is greater. I should tell you that there have been two bills introduced, well, one in the House and one in the Senate, to rescind the embargo. So those bills are there and in play, but obviously they're not being acted on during this Congress. After your article went to press, the Obama administration further amended the Cuba sanctions regulations. Can you tell us what's happened? Well, I can give you a preliminary idea. They address a variety of things, including health. And certainly in terms of the article itself, it looks like several of the concerns we had have been directly addressed by these new sets of regulations. For example, it now appears that it would be possible for collaborative research and joint ventures to occur legally between the U.S. and Cuban nationals, both commercial and non-commercial. That's good news in terms of medical research. And it also appears now that Cuban products that receive FDA approval are now able to be legally sold in the United States as well. So it will give United States citizens access to Cuban products eventually, assuming they do pass the FDA testing. There are a few things that, as near as I can tell in this, that that aren't addressed. And I think I need to be just a little careful here because this has just happened. We've just taken a quick look at this. So I have to say that it's possible that some of these answers may not be entirely correct. But my understanding at this point is the suggestion we made that U.S. students be allowed to pay tuition in Cuba to go to health profession schools there is not included in this new set of regulations. And there's still no provision for patients to travel to Cuba for treatment other than emergency treatment. So if you're in Cuba and break your ankle, you can certainly have it set, but you can't go there legally, at least, to get regular medications or have your teeth cleaned. It sounds as if there have then been major steps in the direction you're looking for. Is there more to be done? Yes, we haven't gotten all the way yet, but this really is a tremendous step forward. And the organization I work with, Medical Education Cooperation with Cuba, or MEDIC for short, has been pushing for these things for a long time, so we're delighted to have this much occur at this point. I think, though, your readers may want to follow the story since it really is developing, and the details, I'm sure, will come out more clearly with a little bit of time and after careful legal review here. But they could do that by going to the MEDIC website at medicc.org, and certainly they could follow 
the U.S. Treasury Department website to see whether there are any additional changes or clarifications to these regulations. But yes, I think this is really a step forward. Those of us who have been involved in this for a while are very pleased by this. Thank you, Dr. Kick.